morning, church. Uh, it's such a wonderful uh, day and I'm really happy to uh, be here joining you all once again in praising and honoring our God. Uh, and I thank God for giving me yet another opportunity to share his word with you all. Well, um, uh, it seems like the pandemic is catching up again. Um, our, the many things that uh, uh, it has robbed many things from us. One thing um, I that uh, this pandemic has robbed of us is the liberty to meet people. I certainly miss meeting uh, you all and meeting people, you know, without uh, being, you know, fearful. Um, and I miss. And all of us, I'm sure, we miss shaking hands with our loved ones or uh, hugging each other. Well, the sense of touch is very, very important. You know? When we meet people, uh, we you know, hug them or we greet them with a handshake because touch conveys a lot of things to the person on the other side. Uh, it has uh, many benefits. Uh, it, it uh, signals safety and trust. It uh, soothes and uh, it also has a lot of uh, psychological benefits and also physical benefits, physical well-being benefits. Um, when, when we were, I was doing my nursing, uh, we were taught the therapeutic effects of touch. Uh, there's a section on communication where we are told and taught about the therapeutic effects of touch. How a person who is not well uh, in the hospital can benefit from a tender therapeutic touch of a nurse because it conveys a lot of you know psychological uh, strength to the other person. Uh, let me share with you my screen to show you one picture. Uh, just a second as I share my screen, yes. Yes, uh, I think you are able to see my screen now. Uh, so here is the a person in an ICU in the pandemic right now. Uh, so all of you know that when a person is admitted and critical in ICU, not many people are allowed to be with him. And uh, especially in this pandemic, uh, it, uh, it has become very difficult, uh, you know, for the nurses to manage uh, being uh, on the bedside of the patient. And uh, they can't even allow their loved ones to be with the patients because of the fear of uh, the spread of the virus. So a Brazilian nurse has come up with an idea where she filled two of uh, the gloves, the surgical hand gloves that are used with warm water and she made it as a uh, you know, grasp of a hand uh, that a person is holding, right? So this was uh, devised by her and uh, this is being used in some of the intensive care units in Brazil. And they are calling it as the hand of God. You no, know, that conveys that there is somebody, you know, if the person is unconscious on the ventilator, but he feels or he or she feels that somebody is holding their hand, standing uh, there with them, you know, which uh, encourages them and motivates them to fight against the infection and come out of it. So uh, what I wanted to say from this is that touch has a very, very important role in all of our, of our lives. You know, it helps us being healthy psychologically and or as well as physically. Uh, the theme for this uh, today's sermon, which I should say that I have borrowed from our GCI Equipper uh, uh, RCL, where we have a series of sermons. So I have selected and borrowed most of uh, today's sermon from this. And it is titled The Touch, uh, The God We Touch touches us. Um, this, uh, uh, today, I would like to speak uh, on um, 
the kind of people Jesus chose to visit, to reveal himself um, after the resurrection. Um, in, in visiting these people, Jesus in some way or the other has touched their lives and transformed them. Jesus has uh, appeared to many people after he was resurrected. Um, and today I would like all of us to look at three people whom Jesus specifically uh, appeared to changing their lives. We can find the narrative of this post-resurrection appearances uh, is very in detail, very much in detail in John chapter 20 and 21. As Pauline has read to us a small portion of that narrative just now. Now, Jesus dies a brutal death uh, at the hands of the authorities. And there was no uh, questions about it. Everybody has witnessed him die on the cross. Then he was put in a donated grave. And um, everybody, his loved ones, they were mourning. But on the third day, suddenly... People started to hear and talk about Jesus being lost from the grave. Some believed he was resurrected. Some believed he was stolen. Some were confused. All of them, I think, were confused. But then Jesus started appearing to people. He started his resurrection appearances. Now, these resurrection appearances were uh, our most famous and also strange stories of Bible uh, in the Bible that we can find, I think. Uh, now, people must have uh, thought that uh, these, these might be strange rumors because his disciples also were not very ready to accept in spite of being prepared, being told that he is going to be uh, you know, rising from the dead, even his disciples uh, seem to be confused and uh, not really understanding what was what has really happened. Now, the two disciples who went, uh, you know, we can find this narrative in the uh, gospel according to Mark. The two disciples who went after Mary Magdalene tells that the tomb was empty, they went in uh, into the uh, uh, into the garden to the tomb they saw the tomb empty and they just fled from there in fear they were all fearful confused scared now this was followed by the many incidences where jesus started showing up himself uh, in between the locked rooms where he uh, he uh, appears to his 11 disciples along with some of his followers who were gathered on the upper in the upper room then he started walking along the paths uh, leading to uh, the uh, town near uh, Jerusalem the town of Emmaus uh, with the, you know where he started talking and discussing about uh, the various prophecies and uh, how they have been uh, you know fulfilled in Jesus and then they don't recognize him. I mean, they must have walked quite a long uh, distance, but they didn't recognize that it was Jesus. And then suddenly, when they sat down to eat, Jesus reveals himself and they see him. And then the very moment he is vanished, adding to the confusion and the scared uh, feeling that the people were having, then he disappears. Then he goes back uh, on, on the next day morning, probably he goes back to the banks of, uh, you know, a river preparing breakfast for his disciples. Then they watch Jesus die and surely he did die. And then he stands there right next to him after three days. Now, don't you think uh, that was a difficult situation for all of them to uh, digest, to understand, to accept? But it was happening. And the stories uh, of resurrection, um, uh, we can see it in all the four Gospels um, mentioned. But John goes uh, uh, in, in, in detail about what has happened than other three Gospels. We can find the stories of resurrection in detail 
uh, in the Gospel of John. That is why we have uh, selected the reading um, from the Gospel of John. So John provides uh, to us the one-on-one -on -one conversation each one of these individuals had with Jesus after he was resurrected. He interweaves the conversations with the uh, facts that were also presented in the other Gospels. So let us look at three of these stories that uh, we can draw from John chapter 20 and 21 about three people whom Jesus chose to touch and have transformed their lives. These three people were Mary the Magdalene, uh, who was uh, the woman, I would like to title her the woman, Thomas, the doubter, and Peter, the coward. So let us look at each, uh, their interaction with the resurrected Jesus and how their lives were transformed after the, their interaction with Christ. Now, Mary, uh, the woman, uh, let us look at her story here first. So early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. Here is a woman walking by herself, but in some other gospels, they say that there were a group of women who went, but John says that it was uh, Mary who, was who went alone there. So here, uh, here we see a woman who is walking by herself in the dark to the tomb. Now, women by themselves walking in the dark is not a very, you know, good idea, uh, even today. And it wasn't certainly a good idea uh, back then also. Uh, given that the atmosphere was uh, tensed and it was lost because Jesus, their leader, uh, their Messiah was dead, he was buried. Um, but in this confusion and this, uh, you know, tensed situation, we see this small sniffling shadow walking her way uh, to the tomb in the uh, darkness of that early morning hours. Now, we do not know very much about Mary uh, through the scriptures. Um, and uh, given that there were many Marys who were mentioned, uh, in this uh, in the scriptures this mary was certainly not the uh, mary from the mary and martha uh, uh, sisters she was not even the one who washed jesus's feet with her tears and wiped his feet with her hair now uh, according to uh, the gospel of luke this mary uh, the mary the magdalene was the one whom jesus healed by driving out seven demons from her. Now, she was a lady uh, who was possessed uh, with seven demons. She, she hailed from a wealthy family, but she was possessed with seven demons, which was not a very, you uh, know, reputable, you uh, know, very uh, good introduction for anybody for that matter. And uh, then, uh, she was healed and then she started following Jesus uh, along with the other disciples and followers. So she joined and uh, it was written, it is written about her that wherever Jesus went, she was following him. So uh, she was following this character from Nazareth, whom some liked and some, uh, uh, no, they didn't like him. They opposed his teachings. Well, all of this looks very complicated as of now. Now complicate this with her gender, being a woman, uh, you know, uh, probably she was not even married and she was following this group of men everywhere they went. And uh, being a woman in those times in the Jewish culture was a bit okay, but a woman uh, in the Greco-Roman society was nobody. She was not given any weightage. She was hardly noticed. And uh, uh, even if she had to testify anything in the courts of uh, Roman emperors, uh, her testimony would not even be considered uh, in legal matters. She would not even be given any weightage. So it was no good uh, being a woman. Now, 
but yet we see that in every gossip uh, in every gospel uh, mary magdalene was the first one to witness jesus from the risen tomb now jesus chose a woman who would not have any weightage even if she testifies that she saw that jesus was risen jesus chooses that person to become the bearer of the good news to the world he knew that her testimony would not be of any value but yet he chose her no longer maybe jesus wanted to uh, prove or show that uh, he doesn't care about the norms of the society no longer will people whom the society deems as a burden or a left out he wants to give them a seat of honor he wants to show that this their testimony will be heard this was mary magdalene whom jesus chose to bring the good news that he is risen mary a woman uh, was chosen to be the first witness to the most important event in event in the history mary was nicknamed as the apostle of apostles because she was the first one to carry the message and the first one to sound the alarm to his disciples now let us look what john has to say as how jesus revealed himself to mary now uh, mary and other women uh, as written in the other gospels they go to the tomb early on that easter morning see that the tomb was open and they run back to inform this to the disciples now once uh, they were told we uh, read that peter and john they come running to the tomb and find it empty they get scared and they flee from that uh, that uh, garden now i think the uh, i think mary also came running back along with peter and john and then once they left she uh, just stays uh, at the tomb uh, crying uh, as to what must have happened to her beloved savior now we read in john chapter 20 verses 14 and 15 uh, she turned around and saw jesus uh, standing there but she did not know that it was jesus jesus said to her woman why are you weeping whom are you looking for mary mistakes jesus for the gardener uh i think uh, it is a beautiful contrast that um, john uh, has brought in here that um, uh, you know just as the greatest tragedy of humanity was born in the garden of eden uh, between you know out of the conversation of a woman with the serpent uh, so is the great rebirth of humanity also begin in the garden here in the garden of the tomb here we see a woman who was lost who doesn't even know whom she is talking to and at that very moment jesus calls her name out she address he addresses her with her name as though he recognizes because he recognizes her very personally in the garden of eden god calls out to adam and eve where are you that was when the humanity was lost god has lost that relationship man has lost that relationship with god and then god calls out that day where are you and today in the garden tomb jesus calls out to mary recognizing her individually recognizing that he was able to reconcile the humanity with himself and then mary turns and says to him rabuni her name which was called out indicates the absolute intimacy of that moment that jesus knows her personally that was the story of mary magdalene 
Now we will have a look at what has happened to Mary after she encounters with Jesus. Now let us go uh, to the next uh, story, the character of the story of Thomas the Doubter. Uh, Thomas was also called the twin. He was one of the 12 disciples. Uh, he was not there with the disciples when Jesus appears to them on the resurrection day. Uh, th uh, this was a very uh, mysterious detail that John includes in his gospel. We do not know why Thomas was missing or from the uh, disciples group. Uh, why Thomas was missing or uh, where he was. Um, John describes uh, uh, the character of Thomas in, in his gospel in the previous chapters, uh, which will help us to understand what kind of personality uh, Thomas really had. Now, in John chapter 11, uh, we see that um, when Jesus was, uh, Jesus hears that uh, Lazarus was dead and then he had to go to see his family in the, uh, in the village of Bethany. Uh, Thomas, who was called the twin, say, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now we can hear a sound of mockery uh, in this uh, situation. Now, because Jesus was going to visit Mary and Martha, uh, and uh, he, they already knew that uh, Lazarus was dead. Uh, and probably uh, Thomas uh, had his own doubts. And uh, in a mocking way, I feel that it was a kind of mocking uh, a way that he says out to his uh, other fellow disciples, let us also go with him and uh, die. I don't know why he must have said that, but uh, that is how he, he, he reacted to that situation. In chapter 14, again, when Jesus uh, was telling his disciples that he, he was preparing his disciples that very shortly he would be leaving them and going away, um, Thomas quickly uh, questions him uh, and uh, confronts him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? So he was, uh, it looks like that Thomas uh, in the early days, uh, before the resurrection, um, uh, as we learn from the Gospel of John, he, he looks like a very difficult man to please. He was doubtful, he was pessimistic, he was shrewd, impatient, and quick to pose questions. Uh, the more he had to wait for Jesus' kingdom, now he was the one, um, he might have joined Jesus because he believed that Messiah is going to bring a kind of kingdom that they all were waiting for. So he was uh, more cynic, uh, as he was waiting for the Messiah's kingdom, I think he became more cynical. Now, some time has passed. Uh, Thomas, the young idealist, is a little more hesitant now. And this is the Thomas that we are going to look and catch up at the end of the Gospel of John. Now, this is the Thomas who wasn't there when Jesus appeared uh, to his disciples. He was out somewhere out. Maybe he is drowned in his worries. Maybe he is watching his people. Yet another time losing one more Messiah because as I mentioned, at that time of history, many Messiahs came and they went. They started some movements, made some promises. They either ran out, ran away with their money or they ended up themselves on the cross like Jesus did. Thomas may be thinking that that is what was happening. And he does not want to be a part of it anymore. He was tired. He was disappointed. Maybe that was the reason why he just detached or went away from the rest of the disciples. And we don't know where he was. But the next week, we see him back with them. Despite all of this, he had nowhere to go. And then he returns thankfully to his uh, group. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Now Thomas has already uh, told them unless he touches the wounds himself, 
he is, is no way going to believe that it was Jesus who is risen. He was very clear that he is not going to take it again. But on the eighth day, let us look what has happened. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Jesus, who made a special stop for the woman, now makes a special stop for Thomas the doubter. In that moment, Jesus even agrees to take the test that Thomas has demanded. He allows and asks Thomas to put his finger in his wounds. Thomas the doubter, the eighth day believer, last on the scene, makes the clearest theological declaration in John. Thomas answered him, my Lord, my God. He declares Jesus as the Lord and the resurrected God. Now, let us look at the third story, the story of Peter, Peter the Coward. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he showed himself in this way. Now, many of us can identify ourselves with Peter. Some of us can relate to him. He was an emotional, moody, angry, impatient disciple. He opens his mouth very quickly and declares some of the most substantial theology. No, he answers Jesus that you are son of God. And then he immediately puts his foot in his mouth. When he heard the voice of God speak from the uh, mount, uh, cloud on the mountain, he proposes to Jesus that he would make tents for uh, Elijah and Moses and for Jesus to hang out in. On the night uh, when Jesus was arrested, he was brave and quick to cut off the ear of a soldier who came to arrest. But within few hours after that, when Jesus was most alone when he was most vulnerable peter says he doesn't even know jesus not once but thrice peter's nature was very volatile now let us look through the eyes of john what he has to say about peter in john chapter 21 uh, this is when uh, peter uh, along with six of his disciple friends uh, go to fish in the night. Maybe Peter also like others was disappointed. Maybe he is still confused. Maybe uh, he, he saw Jesus being resurrected, the tomb being empty. He saw him in the upper room, but still he had his own doubts and his confusions. So maybe he thought now that Jesus is gone or maybe he's going to go away what is left for him now maybe he thought he has to go back to his profession maybe he thought he has to you know do the same old fishing to take care of his family now the boys went fishing that night they end up uh, having nothing and they start to coming back uh, to the shore now that is when they see a person calling out from the shores um, asking them to cast their nets on the right side of the boat and they catch uh, they end up catching a lot of fish and that is when they realize that the person on the shore was no, no, <clears throat> none other than Jesus himself now when they had gone ashore they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread now the breakfast was being made by Jesus for his friends his disciples. Uh, such a wonderful sight it must have been, isn't it? Breakfast on the shores of a river on an early morning, a sunrise. It would have been very lovely. 
Now, again, John uh, provides us with important atmospheric details here. A few weeks before, Peter denied Jesus uh, while sitting beside a charcoal fire. This charcoal fire or fire would have been a constant painful reminder for Peter throughout the past few days, reminding him of the cowardice and the betrayal. Jesus knew that. Jesus also knew that Peter has denied him not once, but three times. And so he decides to ask Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And then he places a very huge responsibility on his shoulders. He instructs Peter to take care of his sheep. Brethren, this is the grace of the post-resurrection world the upside down kingdom, where people who were disrespected become the heralds of good news, where the doubters declare the highest theology, where the cowards become the rock on which the church is found. This is the kingdom, brothers and sisters, where the last shall be the first and the low shall be made high. So next time when you think you are useless or unworthy, think about Jesus. Jesus who chose to talk to first, whom he chose to talk first. This is the new world that started when the tomb was found empty. The woman, the doubter and the coward these are the people Jesus chose to have intimate conversations with after his resurrection. By the spirit, he turned them into heroes whom we know today. Remember, they started as nobodies. Let us look at what has happened to these three heroes of faith. Mary the Magdalene, as the history and tradition holds and tells us, she traveled with Lazarus and other disciples to what is modern day France. She lived out her years in the mountains of the Alpine mountains in caves. Uh, and uh, she was praying and supporting for the churches there. She was instrumental in spreading the gospel to that part of the Europe along with the other disciples of Jesus in that rugged country. She carried the weight of the new church on her shoulders. Thomas the doubter. All of us know what Thomas did. He came down to India to proclaim the gospel. Uh, India in those days was the edge of the world on their mount, uh, on, in their minds. No one ever came back from this part of the world, but yet Thomas came down to India to proclaim what he has seen, what he has touched. Finally, Thomas was killed in India while he was praying on his knees, uh, as the history goes on to tell. While he was praying on, uh, in a particular place, they say it was on Mount Thomas in Chennai, while he was praying there, he was killed by the natives with spears. The person who touched the spear wound of Jesus was killed with spears, proclaiming the good news, the gospel to the world. And Peter, we know that after all those false starts and blunders, Peter went on to become one of the greatest church leaders, the rock on which the New Testament church was built. He served in Rome and he finally was crucified in the hands of the Roman authorities. Um, at his request, Peter was crucified upside down because Peter said he was not worthy to be crucified the way his savior was crucified. Brethren, the woman, the doubter and the coward became the gospel bearers. He, they became the carriers of the greatest work in the history of the world. 
In conclusion, brethren, I'd like to read to you all from John, 1 John uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. 1 John chapter 1, 1 to 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, <clears throat> which was with the father and has appeared to us. Verse three, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. What a joy indeed. Jesus Christ is risen and is alive. He is seated at the Father's right hand, interceding for us. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. Jesus paid it all. It is finished. You and I no longer need to be under the burden, the burden of sin, because Jesus paid it on our behalf. He is resurrected and he is alive. Brethren, the God we touch, the resurrected Jesus whom Mary was about to touch, whose wounds Thomas, the doubter, has touched, wants to touch your life and my life today. He wants to take hold of all our uncertainties, of all our insecurities, of all our fears and anxieties. Jesus knows it all. He knows that we are weak. He knows that we have doubts. And he knows that we are cowards. Yet Jesus is willing to invest in you and in me. He wants to touch you and me and make us whole. Are you willing to give it all to him? Are you willing to accept this resurrected Jesus into your life? and give it all to him. Let us pray. Father, almighty God, we thank you and we praise you, Lord, for visiting us, for speaking to us this morning, Lord, through your word. Yes, Lord, we are weak. We fail you many times through our doubtful nature, with our fearful personalities. We doubt in your ability, Lord. Lord, we ask your forgiveness this morning. Lord, help us to receive your grace into our lives. Help us, Lord, to surrender ourselves, to surrender our lives to you, that we may become the bearers of the good news, that we may proclaim the love, the love that you have given yourself to redeem us from this world. Thank you, Lord, for your supreme sacrifice. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for your love and for your belief in us, even though we do not deserve it. God, this morning, we would like to rededicate our lives to you, Lord, asking us, asking you to help us, Lord. We give it all to you, Father. Take hold of our lives and lead us in the way that you want to walk us in. Thank you for this wonderful message that you have strengthened us today with. Lord, I submit the rest of the service to your hands and thank you once again for your love in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.